Michael Dawson is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Political Science and, uh, of Political Science in the College at the University of Chicago and is the founding and current director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. He is also a founding co-editor of the Du Bois Review. His most recent book, Not in Our Lifetimes, The Future of Black Politics, um, and he is the author of the essay that forms the centerpiece of the recent winter issue of Boston Review. William Julius Wilson is the Lewis P. and Linda L. Geyser University Professor at Harvard University, uh, where he's also affiliated with the John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's also President Emeritus of the American Sociological Association. Uh, his most recent book, More Than Just Race, Being Black and Poor in the Inner City, was released in 2009, and he is the author of one of the response pieces to Mr. Dawson's essay in the Boston Review. Um, and we're delighted to be joined this evening as well by the Reverend Eugene Rivers um, as moderator. Um, Mr. Rivers is widely respected community activist and speaker who has done extensive work on community development, faith-based initiatives, and domestic and foreign policy issues. I'm now going to hand the floor over this evening to Mr. Rivers, but please join me in welcoming all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, what we'd like to do is um, have uh, our two speakers open with uh, some brief remarks to uh, sort of shape the conversation. Uh, I have some questions. Um, for our, our scholars, and then we will open this up to the floor. So I will, in order of seniority, and I live in Boston, so Professor William Jewish Wilson will go first. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jean. I, let me say, first of all, that I uh, basically agree with the arguments put forth by Michael Dawson in his thoughtful paper in the Boston Review, especially his call for the black public sphere and black political organizations to address both racial justice and economic justice for all. Now, like Dawson, I strongly feel that both should be emphasized, but since the quest for economic justice has received far less attention from African American leaders. I will argue briefly for why it should at least receive some attention or as much attention as a struggle for racial justice. Now the pursuit of economic justice as Dawson suggests requires multiracial cooperation. Accordingly, to strengthen the foundation for multiracial cooperation, we need to develop a new public dialogue on how our problems should be defined and how they should be addressed. And this public dialogue should feature a rhetoric that focuses on problems that plague broad segments of the American public, from the jobless poor to the struggling working and middle classes. This new public message should help ordinary Americans become more aware of how global economic changes as well as monetary, fiscal, and social policies have increased social inequality in recent years. It should make clear that inequality in the labor market has risen just as new constraints have emerged on the use of federal resources to combat social inequities. More specifically, it should be explicitly pointed out that many of the government's policies exacerbate rather than alleviate the economic stresses of ordinary families. These include monetary policies 
to combat inflation that elevate real interest rates and lead to increased unemployment. Trade policies that place low-skilled labor in the United States in greater competition with low-skilled labor around the world. Tax policies that favor wealthier families at the expense of ordinary families. And congressional inaction or opposition to programs such as public investment and national health insurance. And although the various racial groups in America suffer from many of these common problems, the racial dialogue in the United States often obscures that fact. And this is seen especially in the tendency to view current problems in the African American community as exclusively a matter of race. Blacks still confront racial barriers in the labor market, as Michael Dawson so clearly points out in his paper. However, many of their problems, especially those of low-skilled African-American workers, stem from changes in the demand for labor in the global economy. In general, highly educated and highly skilled workers in all racial groups have benefited, whereas workers with lower skills face the growing threat of job displacement and eroding wages. If leaders in the African American community perceive the economic problems of blacks as separate from the national and international trends affecting all ordinary Americans, they will be less likely to join forces with other groups seeking economic reform. This would be unfortunate because no group in the United States would benefit more than African Americans from the creation of a progressive multiracial coalition. Okay, Professor Dawson. Um, thank you, Bill. Much like Bill, I agree with um, everything he said. <laughs> That's good. Um, but I think we have a difficult task, um, and I think what, we, what you'll see today is a little bit of a division of labor. Um, given the current hegemony of neoliberalism over the past few decades, in the American public discourse and American politics, neither racial equality nor economic injustice and equality has been at the center of political discourse, particularly within the main political parties in this country. And indeed, I agree with um, Professor Wilson that, uh, particularly among black leadership over the last 20 to 30 years, and there's always been a fight about this in black political history, but over, particularly over the last 30 years, there's been an inattention and, in fact, a disdain for paying attention to economic inequality within the black public discourse and within black politics more generally. Right. The, what makes this a particularly difficult task is then when we look at American politics more generally, we find that most white Americans as of 1990s believe that blacks were doing better than white Americans. Um, and, and from a recent survey work, we know that most, um, many white Americans feel that they're, more dis they're, they're the most discriminated group within the nation racially. So we, on one hand, have to do uh, an immense amount of education and struggle to bring um, issues of class back to black politics, but at the same time fight the fight that's been f that um, African-American activists have been fighting for hundreds of years to also not let the general progressive movement and American politics more generally lose sight of the brutal facts of racial inequality. What I think is one of the key factors about racial inequality that Bill suggested very strongly is that it has a particularly nasty and devastating impact on the poorest African Americans. And that has not a, been the focus uh, of most scholarly work, of most uh, political work in black communities over the last 30 or 40 years. So what I've argued and will continue to argue that we need a healthy black politics, but what I mean by that is not a black politics that's exclusionary, 
virtually all black political movements, even most of the black nationalist movements, had the twin aims of organizing within black communities and influencing and working with those who had similar interests and aims in general American communities. We need a black politics for black activists who not only rebuild independent black political organizations, but also work within multiracial organizations and formations. Uh, we need a black politics that is not is no longer sundered from labor, no longer sundered from economic fights, no longer sundered for the first time, I think maybe in American history, from uh, progressive faith communities, but also reclaims its proud heritage of an internationalism, a progressive internationalism as anti-imperialist. Now, what I think is the silver lining, so to speak, is that when you look at the public opinion among African Americans, there hasn't been as much change among the black mass public or counterpublic, as I sometimes call it, as there has been among black political leaders. African Americans still remain broadly supportive of economic redistribution and social justice. African Americans also were by far the group that most opposed in American military intervention in Iraq in 2003, more than Democrats, more than any other group, period. And in fact, a majority of African Americans opposed the war even when the war was being launched at the time when you normally see a rally around the flag effect. Finally, I think the one thing, another aspect of black politics that we must reclaim is that we must see the, the quest for the struggle against racial equality, inequality not just linked to struggles against economic equality, but part of a universal struggle to promote human flourishing and to bring under control a rogue capitalism that's been out of control for far too long. And this, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Okay, all right, so, uh, I agree with both of you. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, with that said, uh, let me uh, raise this question to sort of drill down into some of the, some of the details of this business. We now have uh, in excess of 8,000 black elected officials and a black president of the United States. Yet, conditions uh, for the very black and very poor, as Professor William Wilson has brutally documented over the last three decades, um, are arguably worse in some areas than they were in 1960. Um, how should one uh, account for this rather spectacular achievement? Well, I, I think that the spectacular achievement is fairly well understood. Okay, well, for <laughs> those of us less enlightened. Ex uh, Gene, you, 20 years ago, you figured you knew what was going on. <laughs> so anyway, um, part, of the, part of my answer is one is that part of it is structural, that when you are elected by a major political power, you are constrained by the politics of that party, you're constrained by who gives you money. Um, black politicians are no different than any other politicians that by and large, with a very few exceptions, they prefer large donations to small donations. Um, <laughs> And thus, um, for a second, I'll be a political scientist. Um, you, those who give you large donations have a tendency to, to occupy one attention, uh, and those who don't, don't. That's, part, that's one part of the answer, but it's not the only part of the answer, maybe not the most devastating part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that I think many African-American politicians have, um, one, increasingly been divorced from struggles of various sorts, whether they're labor struggles. I mean, a, lot, a good segment of the initial uh, seg uh, cadre of black uh, elected officials came out of the labor movement, came out of the Needles and Trading Union, came out of Meatpackers Unions, came out of all the industry, of course, uh, steel mills, miners. Um, but there's a, been, ever since the, Reds, the, the McCarthy era, there's been increasing sundering of the connection between labor and civil rights, or labor and black liberation. Uh, with some notable exceptions like in Detroit in the 1970s, for example. But that being said, um, many of our black politicians today have no connection to, uh, to a legacy of struggle or any act, uh, experience themselves in activist movements. Third is that many of these politicians also believe increasingly that um, there's not much of a structural sto uh, story in terms of either um, 
what the consequences of unregulated capitalism are, can be, uh, rejection of even European models of, of, of capitalist social democracy, um, and very much have, um, I would argue, and this is where we may get some disagreement, adopted a um, blame the victim approach, uh, which makes it very easy then not to focus in on um, the bottom third of, right. of our communities. Um, to quote um, a minister I was talking to recently, uh, who's in, I'm in close contact with, he argued that uh, we have black politicians today who are more conservative who, than uh, Richard Nixon. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> I clean it up for you a little thank bit. You, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, but I would agree with that. Um, the Democratic Party today is to the, to the right of the Republican Party when I was uh, protesting the Republican Party in 1968. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, let me just say that uh, look at this in a slightly different way. Uh, the late black historian Vivian Henderson, who died <coughs> several years ago, stated that it is as if racism, having put blacks in an economic place, stepped aside to watch changes in the economy and technological change destroy that place. And it's unfortunate for blacks, particularly poorer blacks, that two fundamental changes have adversely affected their position in the labor market. One is the computer revolution, which rewards skilled workers and displaces low-skilled workers. And the second is a growing internationalization of economic activity, where low-skilled workers in this country are in greater competition with low-skilled workers around the world. Now, that's just on the economic side. So you, you went back to 1960. Hmm. Now, if you look at the political side, there has been some fundamental changes that have occurred that have contributed to the rising inequality in American society since the early 1970s that affect all groups, and blacks have also been affected. Um, the uh, new federalism of the Reagan administration, beginning with the Reagan administration, where there was sharp reduction in support for urban areas where blacks are concentrated, and much more attention given to those who live in the suburbs. The um, spatial mismatch, that is to say, the growing, uh, the growing uh, movement of industries from the central city uh, to the suburbs. And there's something else that's happened since the 1960s, since you went all that, well, went back that far. Up during the 1960s, the typical black community was densely populated. In fact, uh, families had to share apartments because of the housing shortage. Then the great migration uh, to, from the south to the north suddenly ended around 1970 uh, due to the out migration of industries, so you no longer had the pull factor. Uh, so with the Great Migration ending in, 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 in the 1970s and the out-migration of higher income groups, including higher income blacks from inner city neighborhoods to other parts of the city and to the suburbs, and the, out -mig and, and, and the relocation of industries, poor black neighborhoods moved from areas that were very, very densely populated, reinforced by migrants constantly flowing in, to neighborhoods that have been abandoned and, and what we call depopulated areas. If you watch HBO's The Wire, he captures, uh, David Simon really captures that with the, 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 the 
abandoned buildings and the vacant lots. And these neighborhoods suffer from lack of social organization and they feature high levels of joblessness, incredible joblessness. You know, you can compare poor neighborhoods today with poor neighborhoods in previous years. I'm talking about inner city neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. People were poor, but they were working. Today, you have jobless neighborhoods, and jobless neighborhoods trigger all kinds of problems, ranging from drug addiction, crime, and so on to the breakup of families. I'm sorry to go on so long. That's okay. No, we, we need the analysis now. Right. Well, let me, but, uh, let me yeah, just add one thing I want to add to that, though, is, is actually the 80s and um, Thatcher and Reagan and uh, the implementation of neoliberalism because sure. um, neoliberalism had five consequences that go in hand in hand with the type of globalization that Bill was describing. One was a worldwide, um, sometimes externally enforced um, by international organizations, uh, privatization of the state, which cripples state capacity across, in both develop and developing countries. Mm. Two was an illogical component that said market models are the way that everything should be governed, and those are the values we should embrace. Whether you're talking about arts groups, universities, right. government, all have to run like markets with right. this. Um, third was a dismantling of the social safety net, which put people not only um, made civil society much less capable of being able to take care of their own. Fourth was a deregulation. Um, and fifth is a, f a type of free trade which was aimed at dismantling of labor rights, um, health and safety regulations and, and environmental regulations, uh, all in the name of free trade. All of these have had a devastating effect on the political economy and the politics of um, the, the countries we live in. Yeah, I, I, I take the the macro, macro structural analysis, I take that, that works. I get that, and, and, and so, so I've got a, a few questions. One, I wanna drill down again, however, into the black leadership question. So let's, let's grant these macro structural tendencies that produce the kinds of conditions we have now. Within that context, how are we to understand uh, whatever, one may call black leadership, and then I'll, I'll sharpen that and talk about black elected officials. So are we saying that black political activity, behavior, participation is largely irrelevant to these macro structural deals so that we have what may feel like a sort of uh, a deterministic mm -hmm. scheme, or is there a little bit, not much, agency and within the context of that, we can analyze, you know, were there options, were there bad decisions? I mean, how do we, how do we think creatively? Because behind that question, so, so, so I, I want to push a little bit, how, do we, how are we to think, given the, the trends that you've analyzed, how are we to understand historically, if you will, over the last 20 years, black political leadership, and, 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 and Professor Wilson, I, I, I want to hone in on this because when you wrote the, uh, the declining significance of race in 78, right? The, it was amazing the crazy response you got from established black political leadership. First there was this, this almost tsunami denial that we should even be discussing the question of class, and you caught a lot of hell for that. And then you double back because you give it as well as you take it, right? And, uh, and you, won the debate, you won the argument, you know? And so, 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 so there were, there were, so, so I, I want to press that. And you challenged more than, in fact, you were the, you, you were the man, pardon the, you know, right? The, the challenge, the black political leadership class to focus on the exclusion of the very black and poor, uh, the stuff that we now, you know, understand within the context of the wire. So gentlemen, help me on this leadership, black leadership question. Well, I get the macro analysis. Right. First of all, what I wrote in The Declining Significance of Race, published in 1978, is now conventional wisdom. That's right. Everybody. That's my point, precisely. The points I exactly. made about the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots in the black right. community. And in that book, I was upset that there were very, very few black leaders who uh, signed on or supported the Humphrey Hawkins full employment bill. Right which would have significantly benefited the black masses if it had really gotten some traction. Right. 
What were they focusing on? The Alan Bakke affirmative action. <laughs> now, I'm a supporter of affirmative action. I think it's very, very important. And I'm worried about the upcoming Supreme Court's uh, possible decision, which may overturn affirmative action. But affirmative action benefits primarily the more trained and educated blacks. That's right. And that's why we, we, we still need it. It does not address the demand factors that uh, we have to come to grips with to deal with the massive black joblessness. So yeah, so I talked about those things mm -hmm. and I continue uh, to uh, be amazed at the lack of uh, participation on the part of the black leadership. Uh, for example, getting involved in the, 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 the big debate about uh, trade legislation right. and so on, which, which certainly affects blacks. For example, a substantial majority of uh, of workers in the uh, garment industry are black, you know, <laughs> and it's really been hard hit by uh, by the global economy. A lot of jobs have been lost to uh, uh, places overseas. Uh, but you know, let's. Uh, what I would like to see is black leaders join with other progressive groups. Sure. Right in coming up with a kind of, of, of legislation that would be, that would improve the conditions of Americans and enhance their chances in this economy because right now many of them are being displaced. Okay. Now, that said, what about uh, Barack Obama? I think, what, you shaking your head? No, I was, I was going there, that was the next question. <laughs> uh, things would be a lot worse if it weren't for Obama. I'm going to tell you, he risked his uh, presidency passing health care legislation. And who benefits disproportionately from health care? Blacks, people of color, Hispanics. Uh, one of the reasons why the Tea Party is so against uh, the health legislation because they feel it doesn't really affect them. They have health insurance. It just was created to help those poor blacks. Take the stimulus package, which prevented us from going into a depression. Do you know that the stimulus package included $60 billion for, for low-income uh, low people? $60 billion. Uh, and when this is a uh, blocking on his name now, um, uh, of the head of the Center of Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, what's Greenstein. That? Greenstein, yeah. right. Yeah. Robert Greenstein yeah. uh, was asked by the uh, Obama administration uh, to uh, work up uh, a, uh, a budget that would uh, address <coughs> low-income people. And he came in with a $60 billion budget, and he apologized to the Obama administration uh, because he said, I just decided to include you know, everything, and this is my wish list. And they said, not to worry, we'll include it. And they did. He was shocked, absolutely shocked. He says, I would have, if you had told me 10 years ago that a president of the United States, an administration would include $60 billion in a budget for poor people, I would have laughed at you. You see, I mean, look, I could go on and on about the things that Obama has done, which are somehow not really well known. And part of the problem is he's done a very, very poor job of communicating yeah. what he has, yeah. what he has accomplished. Yeah. Uh, you know, after all, he inherited a $12 trillion debt, annual deficits of uh, close to a trillion dollars, an economy in the tank, and he kept us from going into a depression, which would have severely hurt black people. Not to mention other programs that he's been addressing that range from public education to programs like uh, the uh, Promised Neighborhoods and so on. So I, I'm gonna give Barack Obama a pass, okay. all right? On, <laughs> I didn't, I, I wasn't uh, sure. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so let me, uh, I, one has to obviously ask this question then, Professor Wilson. Okay, is there anything that you disagree with? Well, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm perfectly willing to entertain the idea that we've achieved perfection. 
Right. right. No, 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 no. We haven't uh, achieved, <laughs> achieved perfection. Okay. Now, is there anything that you think he might improve on? Communication. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Getting I agree all these people <laughs> fully aware. I'm, I'm, I've been so sick and tired of hearing left people, people on the left, criticizing <laughs> Obama uh, for what he hasn't done. People like Cornell West and others. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I was on the Tavis Smiley show, you know, and here's Smiley said he hadn't done anything for black people. I said, Have you seen the stimulus bill? Uh, uh, no, I haven't. You know, I, I laid it out for. <laughs> okay. All right, I think, I think, yeah. I th I th right. yeah. <laughs> Professor Dawson. I'm gonna go back to your previous question and work to your last question. Um, one thing in terms of the of black leadership generally, I think we really shouldn't de-emphasize, this is where the agency comes in, right. is the ideological component. Um, and this is, again, uh, drilling down from some of the more abstract comments I made about neoliberalism a few minutes ago. But one of the, the some of the key components of neoliberalism that black political leadership are embracing consciously for either reasons of self-interest or because they agree with them is one is a narrowing of definition of politics to purely electoral politics and all other type of politics um, is considered to be illegitimate or at least ineffective, okay. uh, which totally flies in the face of the history of black um, politics. And with that, of course, is a narrowing of political discourse. And if you go back 20, 25 years ago, maybe even not that long, you would have found uh, a healthy discourse between, um, I would say, social democrats such as uh, Professor Wilson were right in the middle of the black distribution, but you also have uh, fair, fairly large segments to the left, um, black socialists, um, you had uh, black nationalists, you had black conservatives, but there have been an extraordinarily narrowing of the, of the political discourse within the black community, which led to the, uh, the ability to label people such as uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright as being uh, anachronisms or... Um, or at the tail end of the distribution when actually they're in the middle of the distribution and real representative of black politics. Um, <laughs> um, there's also been another part of the ideological and I think a very dangerous one that I think uh, the three of us would agree with is a redefinition of black politics as interest group politics, uh, which among other things leads to uh, fights between, uh, and, uh, less, makes it more, um, makes it easier for blacks and Latinos, white workers, um, and other groups to fight each other when it's just sure. narrowly de uh, defined and narrow self-interest. Uh, uh, very much a narrowing of economic vision um, so in terms of full employment used to be, for a year after, I mean, I, you remember this, is that if you ask any poll of African Americans, whether it was in JET or Dominion University of Michigan, done here at Harvard when me and Larry were doing them, you said, what's the number one problem? Jobs. Right. <laughs> that was always the first um, answer uh, with, without any variation whatsoever. Um, and <coughs> we don't hear black politicians talk about full employment, let alone Humphrey Hawkins. Yeah. Uh, we don't talk about um, extension of unemployment, of unemployment programs. So even when uh, there are programs that are extremely beneficial to um, poor black people or poor people more generally, uh, politicians, I think, I think part of the communications problem is, is uh, his, some of his advisors don't want to make those, those uh, gains known. Right. I, 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 have, I want to come back to something Bill said earlier, and we're going to take two, we've got two more quick questions. Wait, and we're let going me to just go. answer go one thing where I disagree, where if not, I'm not going to disagree with what the president has and then there's two, at least there's two areas where I think that what, where the president has gone seriously off track. Yeah. Uh, one's in the area of civil liberties, and one's in the area of foreign policy. Yeah, okay, on those things. Well, well <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about race, <laughs> class right now. Though. Okay. But you want to talk about that. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. all right, so. Hey, but I, I, could I just ask Michael a question? Sure, of course. Uh, you, uh, Michael, you mentioned <laughs> Lonnie Guineer and, and, and Taurus' uh, uh, a book uh, in, your, in your excellent piece. And they argue that the, uh, the most effective way to involve uh, people of color in uh, racially inclusive coalitions is to organize them first around political issues that are explicitly race specific. And they assert that people of color are less likely to respond to uh, calls for uh, coalition building if their leaders do not first speak to and organize them around matters that relate to their racial experiences. I just wonder, how, what is your take on that? I have a Thor um, 
Well, let me, let, me, let me not be facetious because there's two things. First of all, that comes, that's actually the line that, you, that goes, back to, well, goes back to Garvey, but it, uh, you oh, find right. it in the modern period between in uh, Black Power by, you know, by Carmichael and, and Hamilton in their book. But uh, it doesn't match my experience of organizing, even in the middle of the black liberation movement uh, at its height. Um, when I was organizing black workers, um, you know, talk about speed ups and, <laughs> and layoffs. It didn't have to be racially specific. I, I think what black workers, um, I mean, black poor people want is talk like anybody. Talk about the issues that matter to them. Um, now, what they, what I think, where you sometimes run into trouble is um, if you are part of a group that ignores some of the r racist connotations or racial implications of their lives. Mm -hmm. As you do that, then you have problem organizing people of color, but people of color like anybody else, if you know they can't put um, food on the table, if they don't have jobs, if, they, uh, if they're suffering from extraordinarily poor government service, you can organize around those and it doesn't have to be racially specific and never has been. But, and, and, uh, uh, let me ask both of you. To some extent, is not that question sort of dependent upon context, for example? Of course it is. Right? Um, I mean, if police uh, brutality know, police, is the yeah, number, yeah, right, number right. one issue in right, your community. Okay, yes, right. That's a good point. Okay, right, right. So, yeah, yeah exactly. So, 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 so um, I think both, uh, the, the, depending on the issue and the context, Right? There's certain contexts where people are looking for leadership that roughly resembles them. And I want to say something about this. It sort of gets on my nerves, right? Because um, when it comes to blacks, people say, well, it can be anybody, and we don't need racial blah, 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 right? OK? Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to say that to women, mm -hmm. that women should organize, and they should be able to take leadership from men in women's organizations, I'd get run out of town, or at least Harvard Square, right? So, <laughs> so. What I find interesting is that the two sets of books for blacks, right? Now, there can be any number of interest groups that say they want to organize around whatever their particular ideological preference is, and it's understood as completely, eminently reasonable that, you know, uh, you know, a black conservative Pentecostal preacher is probably going to not lead the transgendered, you know, dot, 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 right? I'm probably not the guy to lead that, okay? No, so, so what I'm suggesting is that you know, on, on this racial business bill, right. I think there's certain contexts where there need to be strategic multiracial coalitions. There's no question about it. Right. So when we're talking about union stuff right. that involves, by definition, right, right uh, uh, multicultural, pluralistic, you know, situations, of course. Right. Now, there are certain contexts where the stuff's going to be racially specific because the only people there are black. Right. 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 So if I'm in Dorchester, everybody's right. black, right? I'd like to be multiracial and hug somebody right. who's different, but, you know, there's nobody there. So, okay. in those well, it goes beyond, is that fair? No, it, it goes I mean, that's, beyond. It, yeah, that's fair, but it goes beyond that a little bit. I mean, I remember being in East Palo Alto, which at the time we called Nairobi. Um, I love that. <laughs> You're so black. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I was I was in a multiracial Marxist organization, and one of my you no 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 no, no. of course well it was okay. just like for five minutes. Um, but um, no no play it. But uh, one of my comrades said um, from Scarsdale uh, said I can organize East Palo Alto as well as any black person. I said why? Of course. Because I'm a Marxist. I said okay, okay. yeah right exactly. I'll give you one week. <laughs> exactly right right right. So, 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 I mean, it's not just that it's who's around, but it's do you understand the people? Of course. Um, if I can't speak Spanish, I'm not ordering, I'm not organizing Islos. Yeah, and, and, and see, if we, and it gets more complicated and nuanced when you talk about appropriate settings, you know, do you, you, do you understand the patois, do you, you know, on and on. So, agree. Yeah. Now, all right, we've got 15 minutes. I and, just, you yes, just go respond. ahead. So, I was talking about a, a, a two-step process. I sure. agree entirely with what you're saying. Right. That is that. The, 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 some people argue that a prerequisite for multiracial involvement is right. first organize black people right. dealing with race issues. Right. Uh, and that's what I was talking about. That's, I, I, yeah. I, I, sh I completely agree with, yeah. uh, with what you just okay. said. Yeah, no, I'm, all right. So, all right, so we, uh, th this is just remarkable amounts of agreement. This is not good. Okay, so, all right, so listen, all right, so we'll, so we'll go to the superior minds, all right, since everybody's agreeing here, all right. Um, we got 15 minutes, and so uh, we want to take questions. Uh, please, uh, as a preacher who has empathy for people going on and on, right, right, uh, try to make it a question in brief. <laughs> Which is, I, I have some nerve, right? <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Rivers panel, Mr. Wilson, Dr. Wilson. Um, there's a previous president of the American Sociological Association, uh, Joe Fegan. Joe Fegan. Yeah, and uh, he wrote a book titled Systemic Racism. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, what would you say to the relevancy of the issues in that book as it stands today? I haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. <laughs> Moving right along. <coughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Most of you are bold, dynamic people. Yes, sir. In your book on more than just race, you, is a certain Professor Wilson, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pastor, will you talk about the benefits of education, how they disproportionately affect black people, whether they have them or they don't have them, and wondering why, again, the politics and the leaders aren't really addressing it as it really can make all the difference in the world for this generation. Well, uh, the Obama administration is uh, okay. addressing uh, the issue of education. I'm blocking on a, what is it called? Uh, race at the top? No. Yeah, race at the top. Right. Um, and part of the stimulus package uh, included a hundred uh, million. Uh, Well, I'm not sure about the figure, okay. but a lot of money. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's sufficient. Uh, in the in, in the in, in the stimulus package uh, for education, and they used it uh, as uh, as a wedge to uh, you know to as a weapon to force schools to reform. And one of the things that the Obama administration has uh, supported is the, uh, the creation of uh, public uh, charter schools so that these schools can compete with the uh, traditional public schools. Now, what is interesting is that uh, a lot of people just categorically dismiss uh, charter schools uh, as uh, not being very effective. But you know, the interesting thing is, is that if you look at the charter schools in Boston and New York, they are very effective. And these are schools that are overwhelmingly yeah. uh, schools of children of color. Sure. Sure. Only, for example, in New York, only 4% of the students in the charter school, public charter schools in New York are white. Are, 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 only 4%, 4% are white. Only 4% of the students are white mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the public charter schools uh, in, in New York City. Yet these schools exceed the um, schools in terms of uh, the scores on the cognitive tests, schools in the um, public the traditional public schools in New York City, and compete very well with those in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, the, the question you have to ask yourself is, what is unique about these very, very successful public charter schools? What do they have in common? Why are they successful? And there are several things that they have in common. One is an extended school day. The other is a ridiculously short summer vacation. Uh, you, know, you know, what happens during the summer months? Children uh, in inner city schools go home and watch TV because their parents cannot afford to send them to uh, enrichment uh, programs. Uh, and so the gap between the haves and the have-nots widens dramatically during the summer. Uh, in these public charter schools, uh, a good uh, part of the time in the summer, uh, they, they are in school. Uh, the other thing is the ability to uh, hire and fire teachers. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not controlled by seniority rules. Now this creates some problems with a lot of people, but the fact of the matter is that they are able to select the best teachers for these jobs, and they do not reward teachers who are not doing a good job in the classroom. Yeah. This is, uh, Obama has gotten a lot of criticism for his support for public charter schools. Yeah. He's got a lot, of, he's received a lot of criticism for his race to the top initiative. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because it challenges the traditional ways that we go about educating the kids. Mm -hmm. It challenges institutional entrenchment. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, uh, uh, that the Obama administration has focused more on uh, public education, put more effort in enhancing or improving, improving public education than previous administrations. Can, can I okay. Go ahead. Yeah. jump in on one thing? Because yeah. I think a huge problem we live in a federal system. Uh, I mean, that's a reality. Um, they cause this problems in, in education is one area. So in Chicago, many of the charter schools that some of my friends are yeah. involved in are doing quite well along the lines that the ones that Bill described in Boston and New York. But uh, there's two other, there's two problems that affect most of the children in public schools in Chicago. One is how sc uh, school, public schools are financed. Um, so there's not enough resources coming into public schools to provide that type of intensive education for most of the children in those schools. And then you, then what the Chicago political leadership has decided to do as most political leadership is to devise a school system that is extraordinarily good, as good as the pri better than the private schools for the upper middle class and the upper class, um, but then not put any resources in the schools that go to the to the poor community. So this is not a racial issue primarily in the least, um, because when you look at Whitney Young and other um, magnet schools in Chicago, they're primarily, the students are primarily p uh, children of color. Um, they're doing really, really wonderful and, and extremely w well. But the poor children in Chicago are not being well served, except for the few that have been lucky to get into some of these uh, special programs. I've got two questions, strategic questions. Um, uh, in, well, actually, it's kind of strategic intellectual questions. Um, the way things are going now, uh, given the, um, uh, the Republicans' party's uh, apparently un unfailing ability to never miss an opportunity to sort of screw up and look completely crazy, uh, the president will probably be elected, re-elected, because he'll be re-elected, right? Uh, the day after the election, he will actually be no longer the leader of his party. So in, what, do, what do we do other than sort of cry and, you know, look to go to Canada uh, what do we, what, how does one think strategically if A, he loses, which is unlikely, but it's a possibility for reasons that you referred to earlier, Bill. And then I want to raise this question vis-a-vis -vis the, the whole question of the black poor and, you know, that bottom third. Uh, how, how is black leadership, because they're going to be more inclined to have some interest in what happens to their, you know, their, 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 their folks. How does black leadership think about the future of the black poor in 2016? So, in fact, some of you may know that about three or four weeks ago, there was a very brilliant piece in the New York Times editorial page that was, I mean, it was, you know, just, you know, smart white boys, God bless them, right? These guys had said, look, we want to get into the real interesting question of 2016. That's the play. The president will probably be elected. And so how do we line up the horses thinking out big picture? So they say, well, so, so that's, the, that's where the action is. Right? The president gets reelected. The, the, you know, the, uh, he, he's broke, uh, well-intentioned. He'll get through his four years. And then you got 2016. And uh, black America is kind of an interesting time dealing with the ideological, political, and cultural blowback from uh, you know, the preceding uh, eight years. So how do we, how does one, as intellectual leadership, political leadership, think about A, what happens if he loses, you know, which again, not likely, and more importantly, if he does win, broke, what do we do in 2016? Well, let me just say, first of all, that I really hope that if he loses, there'll be a mobilization Right. of resources. That is, the, 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 the creation of a multiracial coalition to put pressure, including voting pressure, on both Democratic and Republican leaders mm -hmm. to pursue and adopt policies <coughs> that reflect the interests of ordinary families. If he loses, you really are going to need you need a coalition in any case, but right. you would really need one right. if, he, if he loses. Right. 
And I would like to see, you know, black leaders work with uh, various grassroots organizations, women's rights groups, labor unions, religious organizations that are on the progressive side, organizations that are broadly representative mm -hmm. of the various racial and ethnic groups and all organized and interconnected local, regional, and national networks. Right. That's what I would like to see okay. happen. Okay. okay, now we can get into some areas where we really disagree. Um, <laughs> okay, and we'll come to your question after uh, Professor Lawson. Um, if he loses in 2012, uh, what we're gonna see is a massive attack on labor. Um, even more massive than we've seen already. Right. Um, reproductive rights will be in more risk than they have been in half a century. Um, we'll, I think you're gonna see, have to see that type of coalition coming together, <coughs> but it won't be able to be the comfortable politics for the last, not that they've been that comfortable, but it'll be one of the most fraught situations we've seen in um, mm -hmm. most of our lifetimes in terms of the, the type of savage political attacks. Um, we'll see progressive church, if you saw this under the Bush administration, progressive churches will be brought, hauled before the IRS mm -hmm. and right. accused of violating right. um, tax right. on, uh, right. on nonpartisan rules. Right. Um, so there'll be institutional attacks from the executive branch in Congress on virtually all aspects or any type of progressive institution. Right. 16, gentlemen, either of you, quick thought. Uh, we're gonna end in about three minutes. Uh, how should we be thinking about, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, we've, got, we've got two last questions because I'm supposed to end on time and I wanna. Uh, okay, all right. So there was a person here, then there was a person in the back. So. <laughs> but I'll hold it. Okay, uh, regardless of um, what we think about him, Herman Cain um, really went far in the political process. More so, I know President Obama, of course, made it ultimately. But when you look at other black candidates before Obama, Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, Jesse Jackson, they never went as far as Herman Cain had done in, these, in this past preseason. So um, can you give us your opinion on that or what you think about that? And if it wasn't for maybe his indiscretion, he may have gone even further. Can you comment on that? Well, I think two things. One, in 88, Jackson actually <coughs> ran a, uh, uh, was winning primaries and delegates. So, Absolutely. So right. he, was, he did it far better than Kane. Right. He beat uh, the Green. caucus in Michigan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, won, he won Michigan. So, right. And he did fairly well in 84, too. So yeah. I mean, no, he no, won no. more delegates in 84 than, yeah, right. than Kane was going to win indiscretion or none. Um, I think the, what was clear, though, from the beginning was that um, Kane was never the favorite of the Republican establishment, um, that if he didn't shoot himself in the foot, um, there were going to be the type of massive attacks on him that Gringrich and Perry, um, Bachman, and the others right. have all because um, they didn't see him as ultimately electable and certainly given his ignorance on questions such as um, foreign policy in Libya, um, they knew that he would be um, worse than cannon fodder in a debate with uh, the president. Mm -hmm. What shocked me is how the guy stayed so popular <laughs> for so long. It says something about the political process or how well informed uh, some Americans are. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I think it's very, very important. It's a very, very important movement because it has increased the awareness of rising inequality in American society. Uh, people are now talking about it instead of denying it. And I think we should attribute the growing uh, political awareness of the rising inequality to the Occupy movement. Mm. Uh, reporters are now covering it. Uh, I get calls all the time from reporters about rising inequality. Politicians are now talking about rising inequality. They can't mm. ignore it. So yeah, I think the Occupy movement has been one of the most important movements in the uh, 21st century. Or actually, the last several decades. Mm. Yes, sir. Professor Wilson, you mentioned that you were, really had no disappointments with President Obama. 
Oh, no, I didn't say that. No, no, no. no. Domestic policy. Um, and yet, uh, President Obama has not done nearly as much as many hoped he would to address the, the, the drug war, which causes America to incarcerate six times proportionally African Americans as apartheid South Africa ever did, and which Michelle Alexander has called uh, the new Jim Crow. Yeah. Um, so if you could comment on that and what you think it would take uh, if we're going to go with President Obama winning again, what do you think it will take for this issue, which is devastating the African American? Well, community? it has to be on the agenda, and it has to be. I would think one of the issues that uh, that a coalition, both the one focusing on racial justice and yeah. the one focusing on economic justice, that should be something that would be high on the agenda. Yeah. I agree with you. By the way, I'm taking Michelle Alexander's book to Bangkok with me. I'm flying to Bangkok on Friday. I'm looking forward to reading it. Do you think I'll be disappointed? Uh, great. Okay. Uh, yes. Sir. Uh, I just happen to be in town from California, and uh, I appreciate um, all the comments. One, one question I have, I, I, I do a lot of organizing work in the Bay Area, particularly Berkeley, which likes to think bastion of uh, all that's liberal and progressive and, um, and, and we have a, a, an amazing challenge um, paying attention to the nuancing of black identity as it relates to the way in which political strategies are created to enhance um, the issues of black suffering and I wonder do you all have any thoughts about, about, about that particular challenge in this kind of 21st century uh, Eugene Robinson's book, Disintegration, kind of tries to layer it out a little bit. And I took from that this notion that uh, the, the particular fragmentation of black identity and experience in this country requires a different response or at least a different strategy to achieve progress, uh, given the situatedness of black people in this country, that not all of us are in the same particular boat or <coughs> location. And I just wonder, particularly in, in this moment of coalition building, can I take a take, take shot at that? Um, I, I hear a lot of this in certain forms of kind of academic cultural discourse, you know, it's kind of cultural studies types. Um, I'm not sure if the black identities are fragmenting as much as people say on the planet Earth. Now, that may be true in certain cultural studies departments at certain elite universities where hybridity is, you know, a sacred concept and category, but sort of on the, in, in fact, I almost see the reverse in some ways. Uh, I live in inner city Dorchester, and for the working class black males of various ethnicities and nationalities, there is a continuity because these guys have, all these young people all have a common experience. So I can have Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, blacks, Cubans, there's a popular culture which revolves around the hip-hop stuff, which is global and intergalactic virtually, right? They all relate to that. So while I hear a lot of that, now, now Northern California, the Bay Area is a different thing because you got a real mixed bag. Be careful, I organized there for 15 years. Don't That's why the place is doing so well. No question. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, but, so I'm not sure how much of that, I mean, I think, Go ahead. Now, you, you, you're the ex expert on this. Well, not an expert. I mean, it's been, it's been quite a while. But um, I would argue a few things. One is I agree there, there's a set of common experiences. But I think one is that we see something we saw in the early 20th century, which is those common experiences of being uh, blackness are, f to some degree, fragmenting along class lines right. Um, right. as much as anything. Yeah. Um, second, um, there's always been far more heterogeneity, um, not just in long lines of class and ethnicity among African uh, people of African descent, yeah. um, but also recently. I know that you know going back, f um, organizing the Bay Area, then going to New York and talking to New York organizers was like almost living in different worlds. That's right. To some degree, but that brings me to my third point. What what the way d identities also get forged within movements. And to the degree that you have a, a political movement, that's gonna shape how people view yeah. blackness or express blackness um, politically. Okay. So um, what the political movements we build will have a lot to say about how fragmented or what, uh, what the content of those identities are. Can I, I just wanna catch this last question. Uh, uh, sir. Uh, yes. And, that, and that's our last question, because I'm gonna 
try to be punctual. Go ahead. So I have one, qu one question. Uh, in the sort of macro social uh, analysis that you all laid out, one thing that I thought uh, was missing is something that some of the questions have uh, touched upon, but you know, it's crime and carceral policy. And you know, I'm not so much as interested in you know, how that contributes to black poverty. Uh, I think that's well documented. What's more interesting to me for the political question, the agency question, is that it seems to me to be the principal source of ideological and material differentiation uh, in black communities. And I think that we're kind of dancing around that question um, <coughs> because I think that's one area where black uh, political uh, ideologies aren't as progressive as we might expect them to be. I think that many people are quite comfortable with the idea that, you know, the sort of Chris Rock version of a Manichean war oh, man. between, you know, black people and, you know, niggas, right? Yeah. Um, and it's this idea that, that, that a pathological behavior or criminal behavior separates the two, and that that's why things can't get off the ground in terms of full employment. That's why things can't get off the, the ground uh, in, in terms of redeveloping ghetto communities. And I was wondering, how do you think black leadership can respond to that if there actually is ideological fracturing along the lines of how people think about black criminality? Well, that's your yeah. question. Michael, you do the survey <laughs> well, research. Well, I, I got something on that. Go ahead. So, I mean, once, but that's partly when I guess I was dancing around. And when, when I talked about fragmentation around class, um, certainly the question of incarceration is, is totally tied to that. Indeed, um, a lot of survey work we did in the 90s and the last decade and continues is that um, class division among blacks is how do you think about the police? How do you think right. about crime? It's not that is crime good or crime bad, but how, how much do we do to prevent crime in the first Absolutely. place? How do we reintegrate Absolutely. people? once they've gone through the criminal justice system, right. um, to what degree do we penalize people for drug um, relatively minor drug offenses? Um, uh, there are huge class questions there, but I think one of the answers politically is that we've seen some of those class divisions before, and what is needed, and what I think we'll see, and this is one, one, of, the, one of the, I think, the strong points of Occupy, is one of the ways I've, in the book and the article, is that we can't rely on the organizational forms and ideologies of the 20th century. Yeah. I think we'll, one of the things that Occupy is doing, but I think we'll see it coming out of black and brown communities as well, is new forms of organization. I think we'll see people coming out of, out of prison, people who are involved in, in, in carceral struggles, um, such as women who are organizing families to go see prisoners um, who are, you know, upstate somewhere, wherever upstate is in your particular um, right. community. Those are the type of forms that we'll see political movements draw, draw out of and become progressive and organized around those sets of issues. Okay, and I know we're wrapping up. Uh, on that question, one of the things that's always been interesting to me, uh, just over the last 40 years, is that in the political organizing that I was doing 40 years ago in Philadelphia, what was fascinating sort of among the intellectual, the black, Institute of Black World crowd, the black scholar crowd, right? all, all that kind of traditional, you know, kind of paleo left black stuff, is that there was no theorizing around the issue of black criminality. There was no, I mean, and Rand and Terry and I have talked about this, right? No one had, so if you're living in Philadelphia, and on one side you got Frank Rizzo, on the other side, you've got black organized crime organized by the Muslims in collaboration with the Angelo Bruno family, where the blacks control. Now, this is an amazing thing in Philadelphia, right? And none of the black left, I mean, see, I think part of the leadership, none of the black left engaged the issue of the politics of black criminality, black organized crime, and how it uh, functioned. Within the context, you know, you got your Arukan folk in Chicago. Only people that did it a little bit on a local level were the Panthers. Right, exactly. You know, and and and, and we and we see sort of what that yeah, got lumpen, them. Yeah, so, lumpen, all right, yeah. so much for that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for these brilliant. <laughs> okay, we give our.